Move over, fast radio burst, there's a new astrophysics unexplained mystery that everyone's excited about, and they're called Orcs. The time of the Orc has come. Not those Orcs, they're called Odd Radio Circles. They're big, they're faint, they only give off radio waves, and they're an astrophysics unsolved mystery. So four of these things that have been dubbed orcs were discovered in an all-sky radio survey called ASCAP in Australia in late 2019 by Anna Kapinska. And the research paper describing the discovery was put on what's called the Astronomy Archive server. It's sort of where we post all of our most recent work that hasn't yet been peer reviewed, but you still wanna kind of announce it to the world while it goes through all of that like peer review process to finally get published, which is what has happened now in mid January, 2021. This work by Norris and collaborators has been published in the Astronomy Society of Australia journal. And so that's why we're chatting about them now. But to be honest, there's so much that we still don't know about these odd radio circles. In fact, this paper is actually the only research paper that's actually been published about them but you can bet that even as we speak there are radio astronomers that are trawling new data and old archive data to try and find more of these orcs. That is handsome orc. So I guess we should go through first what we do know about these orcs and that's literally from the observations we've got of them from these images in the ASCAP survey. So we know that they are quite large, sort of relatively speaking anyway, they're about an arc minute across. That's about 3% of the size of the full moon, just sort of for context. If you compare that to, you know, stars, which are just tiny little points, it's kind of fairly large in the sky. They appear highly circular and although they're very, very faint, they're much brighter on the edges of the circle than they are towards the middle. They're only visible in radio waves, so if you look at the exact same part of the sky with an optical telescope that uses visible light or a UV telescope or an infrared telescope, you don't see anything. It's not like you see sort of like a faint fuzz. There's just nothing there that looks anything like this round structure. What you do see though in two of the four orcs is maybe there's a galaxy in the middle of them, but it's very small because it's very, very far away. And so the question is whether the galaxy has actually anything to do with those orcs, especially because only two of them have a galaxy that looks to be in the middle and two of them don't. So when you find something like this in astronomy images, which is weird and not anything that you've seen before, there's two questions you need to answer, right? The first one, is it actually a real thing that you've observed? And two, is it a new thing that you've observed? What is this new devilry? So let's start with that first one, trying to determine if it is actually real. So what do I actually mean by this? Well, you have to work out whether what you've taken an image of is actually something in space, like a real object in space, and is not just some weird fluke of the camera or the telescope that you're using, especially if you do a bad deconvolution. Now, deconvolution is essentially just a fancy word for like, enhance. 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 Freeze and enhance. Essentially, you can remove the effects of the atmosphere that distort your image as you're sort of looking through the atmosphere to something in space. If you do that wrong though, and you do a bad enhancement or deconvolution of your image, then you can end up with an, an imprint of a circle on your image, which is essentially just an imprint of the resolution of the telescope, i.e. the smallest thing that the telescope can see but it is very clearly a circle. So you can imagine why the astronomers were a little bit wary when they found these circle-like things in their image that it might have been just a bad deconvolution. But after finding them in the ASCAP survey data, the authors then observed the same part of the sky, but with the Australia Telescope Compact Array, or ATCA. That's another radio telescope with a different resolution entirely, and also it uses a different algorithm or a different piece of software to deconvolve its images to get rid of that atmospheric distortion. And they found these odd radio circles were still there in those images. And crucially, they actually had the same size as was first seen in the ASCAP images as well. So that suggested it was real if you could do a repeat observation of it. So that was sort of like the first job done. It was kind of like a, phew, these things are real. 
Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. But of course, once you've proved they're real, you've kind of made more work for yourself because then you've got to prove that it's something new as well, which essentially involves just trawling the literature, reading all of the past research papers that have been published by radio astronomers and optical astronomers and everybody alike, and trying to go through all the possibilities and ruling them out one by one. Because the thing is, circles in radio images aren't rare things at all. In fact, we do see circles very often. Essentially, they're produced by shock waves. Anything that's a circular object that then expels material in all directions will give you a circle. So for example, supernova leftovers give you circles in radio images. Planetary nebula, which are left over from the death of stars like the sun, which are too small to go supernova, they give you radio circles too. Or even like shells of material around stars that pulse. These are all things though that we see in our own Milky Way galaxy. And that kind of would make sense and it would explain why these odd radio circles, these orcs are so large. Because if it was in our Milky Way, they'd be a lot closer if it was something that was like extra galactic that was in another galaxy outside our Milky Way. But Norris and collaborators in this research paper where they announced this discovery essentially went through all of these possibilities and ruled them all out already. So for example, they first ruled out the fact that they could be relics of a, of a supernova remnant, for example, like in our own Milky Way galaxy, because the majority of supernova are all concentrated in what we call the Milky Way plane, because the Milky Way is a flat spiral disc shape. So in the sky, you see that as a sort of a long, thin thing running through the sky. And those are the coordinates that you tend to see the majority of supernova remnants because, well, that's where the most stars are. But these odd radio circles were coming from out of the galactic plane, sort of up and out of the galaxy. Then the planetary nebula were ruled out because this spread in the wavelengths, the radio wavelengths that you got from these orcs was nothing like what you'd expect to get from a planetary nebula. It didn't look anything like it. And then the sort of shells of material that were given off by these pulsating stars was also ruled out because stars are very, very small. And so the shells around them were quite small in comparison to these one arc minute diameter that have been seen for these orcs. So that kind of ruled out all of the possibilities in the Milky Way, suggesting that they were actually something extra galactic. Like, for example, could they be associated with a ring galaxy like the Cartwheel Galaxy, which we've talked about on this channel before? Because these usually have radio waves coming from this ring around the galaxy where there's lots and lots of stars forming. But one very simple observation rules that out, and it's the fact that there's no great big whopping ring galaxy that is coincident with these odd radio circles. Like con considering like the size that you'd expect for a, a typical galaxy or in a typical ring galaxy, and the size of the odd radio circle that you that we actually observe, we could estimate sort of like the distance that we'd expect a galaxy to be at, and if it wasn't that distance, we should very easily be able to spot it. It shouldn't just be like a fuzzy blob, like what might be at the middle of them. It should be like beautiful and resolved in one of these incredible pictures like you see of the Cartwheel Galaxy or Hoag's object or something like that. Other things like Einstein rings caused by gravitational lensing because of general relativity, bending space-time are also ruled out for the same reason because there's no optical or even infrared emission coming from the same place in the sky. So if it's none of the known things, then I guess the million quid question is still, what are these orcs? Do you know how the orcs first came into being? So the authors of this paper, Norris and collaborators, their best guess right now for what these things are is one of two things. The first thing they say is that it could be something we've seen before, but we're just seeing it from a different angle. So for example, the radio jets given off from the surrounding regions around growing supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. I like to say that these growing supermassive black holes are burping. But remember, the stuff doesn't come from the actual black hole itself because nothing can escape a black hole. Uh, it comes from the, the surrounding regions. And so they suggest that perhaps we're looking at one of these big radio galaxies that's giving out all of this radio emission in these jets, but down the barrel of the jet as if we're sort of just seeing it edge on. The problem is, of course, once again, that there isn't a galaxy with a growing supermassive black hole that's anywhere near these orcs in the sky. Sure, two of them have, you know, a very distant, faint little smudge of a galaxy that looks to be in the center of them that could be something to do with them. 
but we'd know about it if they had a growing supermassive black hole because they're incredibly bright, weirdly. The gas that's spiraling around them that's gonna get eaten by the black hole that the black hole is gonna use to grow heats up because it's moving at such incredible, incredible speeds. And as it heats up, it starts to glow very, very brightly across all the optical, UV, X-ray, everything. We call these quasars, which is a word you might have heard before. And we can see them to incredible distances. They're some of the most distant objects that we can actually detect quasars. So if those galaxies had a growing supermassive black hole in the middle, it would be really, really obvious. Now, of course, the black hole could just not be growing anymore. And we could be seeing some sort of radio relic of what was there before. But what puts paid to that idea is the fact that the orcs are brighter around the edges. And it's this edge brightening that just doesn't make sense for what we expect with radio jets that come from the regions around supermassive black holes. And it's this brightening around the edge that really is the thing we have to go off here. And it's sort of what Norris and collaborators sort of tuck and run. Because if we had a circular object in space that had maybe uh, exploded or sent off a shock wave uh, out into space in all directions, then we would definitely expect to see a brightening at the edge of that shock wave. Now, there's lots of different things that could come under that header, including supernova, which we've already ruled out. But there's lots of newly discovered things that could also maybe be described like that by a circular object that's giving off some form of shock wave or explosion. For example, fast radio bursts as well could possibly be something to do with magnetars, we think, but the sort of jury is still out on that one. And perhaps that could be some shock wave that's sent out and produces one of these odd radio circles. Gamma ray bursts as well, similarly, but then also neutron star, neutron star mergers that have been detected in gravitational waves by the, the LIGO and Virgo observatories as well. They're all now contenders for these odd radio circles and they wouldn't necessarily have to be from, you know, neutron star, neutron star merger in our own Milky Way galaxy or a fast radio burst in our own Milky Way galaxy because most of the fast radio bursts we've detected are extra galactic as well. So it would still make sense in terms of the size but for the size that the odd radio circle is, if it did come from just uh, you know, a magnetar or a neutron star, ne neutron star merger in another galaxy, it's so much bigger than the galaxy itself. It would mean that it sort of been traveling that shockwave for a very, very long time. And that would explain you know, why they're so big and perhaps so faint as well. So anything that did trigger them would have happened so long ago that there's probably nothing there that we can now observe or see in terms of a fast radio burst or a gamma ray burst or anything like that. Now we have to remember that they've only found four of these orcs. So that's a tiny number to go off. Really what we need is to find a lot more of them. And then we can figure out, you know, what's more likely from what we've actually observed. And perhaps it'll turn out that they're not actually all described by the same thing. Thing. Perhaps uh, they sort of look similar, but actually, you know, two of these orcs could be described by one thing, like a neutron star merger or something, and two of them could be described by the radio jets or something like that. We just don't really know enough about them right now. And that's why, you know, we're still in sort of the murky realms of small number statistics, and we can't really make any firm conclusions yet. I guess you could say that radio astronomers are just waiting for the day that the literature is just swarming with orcs. So one thing is for sure, until we find more of these orcs and we get more data on them, they are going to remain an unsolved mystery. Before you get to watch me make mistakes in the bloopers, I just want to take a minute to thank this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that makes learning accessible, interactive, and most importantly, fun. It's all about active learning, getting you to really interact with the concepts and really visualize what's going on so that you're much more likely to remember what you've learned. They have a huge range of courses from all areas of science, maths, and computing. Now, I'm really excited about their new Statistics One course, which covers all the essential statistic methods and ideas that scientists like myself use to determine if our results are significant, even with limited data, like the four orcs we had in this video. Everything from p-values to chi-squared statistics is in this course, and I'd recommend it to all budding scientists out there. So if that sounds like you and you want to support me and my channel, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up completely for free. 
plus the first 200 people that go to that link, which is in the video description below, will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant. And now I'll roll those bloopers. My email just binged and I have no idea where it binged from because, oh, my laptop's behind me. <laughs> All right, we did that whole opening section with my laptop open behind me, but never mind. I'm not doing it again. So these four orcs were discovered in an all sky radio survey done using the ASCAP telescope in Australia. ASCAP? ASCAP. It's not a cat. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard.